Hi, welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. And I'm Brian Michael. We have a special episode. Every episode is special because we're at home. Yep, you're together in our hearts. Uh, this is a comfort food films uh, episode. And what we decided to do was because everyone is just a little extra stressed because of everything that's kind of going on, why not share our favorite films that we watch that kind of give us comfort? And originally what I, I think I pitched this idea, I don't remember which, but- This um, was your well, idea. I, my idea was that kind of, kind of those surface films that were more lighthearted and um, kind of frivolous perhaps. But the more I kind of thought about it, you know, that comfort can be also immersive, not just surf, surface. Certainly no, no sickness or politics because everyone's sick of politics at this point in time. But even like something like, I thought, the more I thought about it was like 2001, even though it's a heavier film, is kind of a comfort film because it takes me away to another place, which is really where I want to be some days at this particular time. So even something like Charlie's Angels uh, 2, Full Throttle, which is one I should have really picked. I kind of def I, I kind of thought about it today and all of a sudden these movies came to me. Uh, Bob Hope's Casanova's Big Night or Woody Allen's Love and Death. Um, there are certainly some silent films, not just Chaplin and Keaton, but Patty Arbuckle or Harold Lloyd. Those are films you can certainly explore at this time since we have nothing but a lot of free time. Um, but um, something like Big Country, which is always a comforting film for me at the time when I first saw it with my sister at a very difficult time. But so Angela and I kind of gonna share the films that we watched that kind of give us comfort. And I we could normally speak of the five films that I normally watch every year, um, though it has kind of grown a little bit, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, one of them would be His Girl Friday, but I've talked about that on, show, on this show so many times, I figured I'd go with a different one, um, which was The Awful Truth uh, from 1937, directed by the Academy Award winning Leo McCary, who won an Academy Award for this actual film. Um, actually, this film was nominated for a lot of Academy Awards. It really surprised me because it's a comedy. Um, it did win for Best Director. It was nominated for Best Picture. It lost to The Life of Emil, Emil Zola, which is a film we liked, but is nowhere near this immense Not as good as this one. Yeah. Uh, it was nominated for uh, Actress, as well as Supporting Actor, uh, for uh, Bill Bellamy, who lost to Joseph, I can't pronounce that, direct the actor's name from Life of Zola, a Supporting Actor, uh, the screenplay and editing. And of course, Cary Grant wasn't even nominated that year, but the actor who did win Best Actor was Spencer Tracy for Captain Courageous, a terrible movie and a terrible Horrible. performance. Horrible. He should at least been nominated. Uh, so it stars Irene Dunn as well as Cary Grant, who are two socialites who may or may not have cheated on each other, or one of them had, or one of them hadn't. It's never really quite told, but all of a sudden things kind of fall apart and they kind of go through divorce. They go through divorce proceedings. Um, she, of course, immediately uh, starts dating uh, a character played by Ralph Bellamy. Now, when I say Irene Dunn is pitch perfect in this film, and Cary Grant is always amazing. Ralph Bellamy in this role is right up there with them because my favorite scenes in this movie, he also is in and he helps carry all of those scenes as he plays a, plays a man that's not as the sophisticated level that they are as a couple of socialites in New York, shall we say. He's from Oklahoma. And um, uh, they're, so they're divorced, she begins dating him. And uh, then of course, Cary Grant's character dates another socialite and so, both of them kind of keep coming in back and forth in one another's life because of the shared custody of the dog that they have. And maybe, or maybe they don't end up back together. That's up to you to see when you see this film. And like I said, it's beautifully directed. It's fantastic editing. It's amazing performances. And my uh, favorite scene in this movie, I think we had just recently talked about it because we talked about Cary Grant, is the nightclub scene where he is uh, there with a young lady. He is dating Irene Dunn, shows up with Bill Bellamy. And the young lady proceeds to sing a very hokey uh, song uh, and song and dance that actually the Bill Bellamy character enjoys. Uh, Cary Grant is embarrassed. Irene Dunn is embarrassed for him. And then eventually the band plays a, a song that Bellamy knows that he can go out there and sing or he can go out there and, and dance and pulls Irene Dunn out there. And they do kind of a hokey two-step that much to the delight of a very embarrassed at the uh, previously Cary Grant who now enjoys it and pays the band leader to play the song again, uh, much to the crowd's chagrin. I love, love this movie. And anytime in a bad mood, I can easily put this movie in or bring in a baby, certainly, or his girl Friday. But this is one I really wanted to, to focus on this time. I know that you love this movie as well, Angela. I do. In fact, this film, um, 
is a perfect comedy, I would say. And, um, and it's one I can come back to time and time again. So I'm really glad you picked it. You know, it's funny when you were talking about comfort food films, when you first told me what it was, I started thinking more guilty pleasures until you sent me your list because you sent me yours before I came up with mine. And then when I saw that they were all actually really good, I thought, oh, girls just want to have fun is not going to make it on this list because this is not a guilty pleasure one. This is going to be um, this is going to be one where I'm picking quality and awful truth is certainly quality. Um, this is a perfect comedy. I, I forgot that Cary Grant wasn't even nominated for this, which is a crime that happened to him a lot though, because he makes it that the problem with him is he makes it so effortless that you don't realize how great the comedy is and his timing is so impeccable. And he makes Irene Dunn look so good in this film that, I mean, not that she doesn't look good on her own, but he gives her lots of room to do her comedic things. And that was one of the great things about him is he was a generous, um, you know, co-star. So yeah, perfect film. And Leo McCary also did one of the most depressing movies of the thirties, Make Way for Tomorrow. So one of the most delightful and one of the most depressing. So great, great director. So very good pick. Uh, so then, oh, mine, oh, I get the next one as well. Yeah, you think it'd be the same format. Uh, you know, I recently texted Angela and I said, I think I have a new annual film because there's certain films that I watch once a year, we'll just do the right thing or Citizen Kane, Love and Death, I don't know, I can usually rattle these off, The Godfather. And uh, Victor Victoria from 1982 has become one of those films. Now, was it my top 10 or top five? No, it's a flawed film, but it's one that I thoroughly enjoy. It's one from my youth. Um, it was the first time I saw somebody who was queer up on screen. And so certainly uh, Robert, per uh, Robert Preston's performance as Toddy is one of my all time favorites. And whenever a straight man plays a gay character, I usually don't care too much for that except for Bill Hader. And also here with um, Robert Preston is a fantastic. Uh, originally it was supposed to be for Peter Sellers which made it a very different film. Um, this was nominated for a lot of Academy Awards, uh, Julie Andrews. Though I hate Mary Poppins and I hate The Sound of Music, but I love SOB and I love this movie. So it's when she works with her husband that I really enjoy, Blake Edwards. Um, they, uh, she is, uh, it's in the 1930s. She's a struggling female soprano who finds work with the help of Toddy to play a male female impersonator. So as I said, she's a woman pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman. And of course that complicates her love life when she meets James Gardner. Um, uh, who's very good in this, and of course, he's very funny. The only thing in the movie is about three quarters of the way through where he has a hard time because he's, they're dating and it's perceived that he is gay. And so he has a problem with his, with his masculinity and starts fights and it's, it's rather silly. And I wish that portion of the film had been cut out. Now, as great as everybody is in this movie, Leslie Ann Warren comes in as the mall, as James Gardner's a girlfriend from Chicago. She comes in and she steals every scene that she is in. And she does a great music, a lot of musical performances in this film that I thoroughly enjoy. And um, it's just one of those movies that just makes me, me laugh from beginning to end. Blake Edwards always has a great uh, portion of those movies that are silent, um, where it's very funny. And there's a restaurant scene where she puts a cockroach in her salad to try to get a free meal. And that one uh, where uh, hilarity ensues. There's a great bar fight uh, scene, or I should say a nightclub uh, fight scene. And of course, she has great, com uh, great uh, comic timing and chemistry with Robert Preston. And, you know, I, I can just put this movie in. It's supposed to take place during the 30s. It definitely has an 80s <laughs> production value. Yeah, um, it looks 80s. Yeah, it totally looks 80s, which is totally fine. But I just absolutely love this movie. And it just warms my heart. and makes me smile and laugh every time I see it. I don't know anybody that loves this movie as much as you do. So it's interesting. I like this movie. I've never loved it the way you have. I think this might be the second or third time over the years you've mentioned it on the show or reviewed it on the show. That's okay though, because we've been doing this a long time. Um, you know, I enjoyed it. I still don't understand why, how you can hate Mary Poppins. You use the word hate about Mary Poppins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, which one's the one where the Nazis are after them? Because I really- The Sound of Music. The Sound of Music, yeah. I, I want for those kids to get caught. Um, yeah, no, the Mary Poppins, I just, uh, Dick Van Dyke's got the horrible accent. It just doesn't work. I love Mary Poppins. It's one of my favorite Disney musicals, live action. But I mean, really. <laughs> um, but but this is an enjoyable film. It's funny, you know, recently I rewatched Tootsie, uh, um, you know. Um, I could have made my list, though, yeah. What? That could have made this list as well. I love that movie. Yeah, I rewatched Tootsie recently and it's it really holds up other than it's got a really bad dated 80s score. Like the music is really horrible. 
but I forgot how great Dustin, I mean, I knew Dustin Hoffman was great, but, the, but um, also um, Terry, oh my God, I'm gonna forget her name. Terry Garr was nominated, so was Jessica Lange. Jessica Lange won, and that's why Leslie Ann Warren didn't win. Oh, they were the same year? It was the same year. So you had a lot of these cross-dressing movies that were all of a sudden happening. Oh yeah, one wasn't influenced by the other, probably. It just was a coincidence, interesting. Yeah, Terry Garr actually, I thought was, I maybe should have won over Jessica Lange. In terms of those two, maybe Leslie Ann Warren's the one that actually should have won, but I really forgot how great Terry Garr was in this, in Tootsie. But yeah, Victor Victoria is just a really enjoyable film. And um, and it's good to see um, Julia Andrews getting to do an, an adult performance, a grown up performance. So. Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to my uh, comfort food film. So uh, my next one, my first one is Swing Time from 1936, uh, directed by George Stevens. This is a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers musical. Uh, back when um, COVID first hit, um, Criterion Channel had all, all of the Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire pairings. And I just binged them because I couldn't handle anything back then. I was just like, I'm going to watch nonstop Fred Astaire musicals because that's as much substance as I can handle right now in life. And I watched all of them and they're all and they're all really, really good at, to varying degrees, but they they tended to do these plots over and over where they got mixed up and they didn't know that the, the other one was supposed to be with the other one. And Swing Time doesn't have that plot, so I enjoyed that. Um, but it also has some of their best set pieces and some of their best performances and dance numbers. It's just one effervescent dance sequence after another, a fine romance being one of my favorite ones where they're out in the snow and they dance in the snow together. I think one of the reasons is that George Stevens is a real heavyweight director who knows how to direct actors. And some of the other directors they worked with were just kind of studio directors that were hired for the job. And Ginger Rogers really gets a chance to shine in this movie. Some of the other pairings, Top Hat comes to mind. We're a little bit more focused on Fred Astaire's character. So. Um, there's so many great scenes, even the scene where they first meet in the dance studio and he pretends that he doesn't know how to dance and she's a dance instructor and her, her boss is making her teach him how to dance and um, her boss is yelling at her and is threatening to fire her and so she starts showing him the moves and then he starts dancing and the dance instructor's like, or the, the, her boss is like, wow, you really taught him and he starts flying across the dance floor. There's just so many great moments like that, so. Yeah, you know, I, I watched that scene actually today because, I, you know, they all kind of, I don't know how you can differentiate them when you watch them all together. They all kind of, it's just, even with the James. They did blur together, but Swing Time st stands out, actually. It's the best one, I think. The thing I noticed, though, when they're dancing is that she grabs under her skirt, her dress, and holds it up, and he's able to put his arms out, and he's a little lower, and he's in front of her, so, so he gets the foreground more. Plus, his feet, he has those covers on his shoes, and I forget what those are called. Um, so his feet, so his, his movement actually sticks out a little bit more. So it's really unfair because she's just as good. And if not, she's a better actor, I think. Um, and of course, she did everything backwards in heels. Um, she is a better actor. She had more range. She was able to, she did other films besides the, you know, musicals, unlike him. I mean, he did other ones, but not, he was mostly a song and dance man. She did dramas, other movies, yeah. So yeah, that's a, those are so much fun. And of course, that big lavish production number, that's a huge set. There's always stairs. It's yeah, those are those. Yeah, you can just sit back with the, with some with some hot cocoa and, and popcorn and just melt them. Yeah, and there's also a big Art Deco sequence in this one, which is fantastic. So they always had like one big stage number too. So and I love movies that have that. It doesn't matter why. <laughs> anyway. She's not just this cold-hearted, mean person like she comes across sometimes in the reviews. She's nice and warm. Look at that. I never come across as cold and mean-hearted. My fans know that I'm warm-hearted and loving. Oh, I'm just reading the notes Brad gave me. Sorry. Oh, okay. That was Brad, huh? So we'll move on to my next uh, my next pick, which is The Odd Couple from 1968. Recently, I wa rewatched this one um, a couple times this year, actually. This is, I forgot how freaking funny this movie is. Um, and I thought of my dad a lot whenever I watch a Walter Matthau movie, any Walter Matthau movie, because he's one of my dad's favorite actors, and he got me hooked on it. And Jack Lemmon is one of my mom's favorite actors. So we could watch The Odd Couple and everyone in the family is happy growing up. So we watched The Odd Couple and they made this into a very successful TV series as well. But you watch the original movie and Matthau and Lemon and they went on to do a bunch of other movies together and some of them are quite good. Um, but this one really cemented that partnership of Jack Lemon playing the uptight guy and Walter Matthau, the lovable schlub, you know, messy 
And so you have the two types that we've seen repeated in films going up to, for instance, you know, Thanksgiving classic, planes, trains, and automobiles, you've got the lovable schlub and the uptight suit guy. So th that, that formula that you see here in the odd couple repeated over and over, but their chemistry is so good. And, um, and I just showed this to my husband for the first time um, when we watched it. And, you know, it's just, it's so funny. It's so funny. And Walter Matthau and Lemon's comedic timing is just amazing. Now, if I remember right, it's not spaghetti, it's linguine. Now yeah. it's garbage, is what I always remembered, because this is a Channel 12, KTU, or KPTV uh, movie that they showed at least once a year. So I got to see this a lot when I was growing up. And, um, you know, Lemon is an amazing actor. I mean, he's one, he's your favorite actor, he's your favorite actor of all time. Um, and um, he can just do just about anything on screen. And Matthau is no slouch, well, he is a slouch in this movie, but he really holds his own in the chemistry between the two of them. And there's a reason why these guys made so many movies together and they were so good. I did enjoy the television show and I thought they was perfectly cast as well. But um, yeah, these two were just, were so good. And it's really interesting because in the time of, I think one of them was divorced or both were divorced in the movie. That's what brought them together. So that was kind of an interesting time in the 70s when divorce was becoming a little more um, yeah, 68. So it's becoming a common. Yeah. Lemon has just lost his wife and he's, oh, I'm going to kill myself. And Matha's, you know, a bachelor. He's been divorced for a while and he's just like, oh, you can live with me. But then the thing about Lemon and you see him do this in Some Like It Hot as well. He would, um, I don't want to say play gay because that sounds like a stereotype, but that's what it was in the 60s. Right. But he would he could do that in a way that it's funny without being condescending. You know how he did it in Some Like It Hot and he does, I forgot how much innuendo there was in this film where he's walking around with the apron and he's very upset when Walter Matthau comes home late from his job. Walter Matthau's character is a sports journalist and he's sitting there with the apron and he's got a gorgeous dinner set with candles on the table and he's like, you're late. And Walter Matthau's like, what are you doing? You know, and He's just like, I had dinner already. You don't appreciate my cooking. You know, he gets all hysterical and he just, and some of that, you know, it's just this great, chemistry but it's also this little innuendo of lemon's character that i love that he's the wife and the relationship so to speak yeah no they, they yeah he well i mean lemon could just do so many so many good things now this was a neil simon play which always don't you know those are really interesting how some will translate to the screen and some don't and either some will be by the director or some will be by the cast who can yeah. have his you know his dialogue and, and, and his moments in those films, those are really hard, to, that's a really interesting, when you put them all together and you line them up, you're like, yeah, those are hits and those are misses and some were hits even though they were misses. And so it's interesting, but these, this is one that certainly, you know, found the lightning. Yeah. I think it's a lot. All in the apartment, it all takes place in one place. So you could see why it was a play, but I think because of the chemistry of the actors and they were able to somehow translate the writing over to the cinema where it works, but you're right, a lot of Neil Simon stuff doesn't always, it just depends. You have to have the right actors too. So, okay, so I'll move on to mine. And as always, I get to cheat a little bit. And I didn't even know. Uh, this is from 2019. It's Downton Abbey. Don't say downtown. Downton Abbey, uh, directed by Michael Engler. And uh, this, of course, was uh, based on a television show. So while you're, you know, at home alone and you're wanting some comfort food, it's, you know, you can watch six seasons of the television show, which is highly acclaimed. And so it's probably the closest thing I get to a soap opera. It's a very comforting television show. And then you get to the movie, which was just wonderful to see in the theater. I don't remember, we think we reviewed it on the show, but you weren't, I think it was just me. And I didn't review it. I think you reviewed it with Kara, maybe? You the film. Someone else that watched the show, because I don't. <laughs> dress up. It was the perfect movie for the Salem Cinema crowd, um, because all the cotton tops, we all got to sit and watch our, uh, watch our movie, uh, which was based on a television show. The reason I love this show so much is that it's from a far forgotten, you know, earlier time in the 19th the 1900s and um some of the problems that they have are just kind of i mean they're not laughable but they some of them were pretty kind of laughable today by today's standards to see that this one is the, the it's the whole um uh, that the royal family is coming to downton to dine and of course everyone is freaking out because the butler can't quite handle this so they have to bring carson out of retirement of course they had to figure out how to get him on the big screen and when he shows up everyone applauds in the applauds in the theater but um you know, like if the uh, dessert plates don't match, you know, the lunchware and oh my gosh, and that's a, that's a whole drama. And you can just be like, yeah, that's horrible. And you just kind of smile and kind of laugh because it's just kind of silly. 
And of course, there's more layers to it as Angela would, if she watched the show, would be there's the downstairs and the upstairs, which literally is the higher and lower class. And oh my goodness. But um, I do enjoy this because of all the little things. So there was a couple of things that were a little, you know, tied to drama, higher drama, soap opera. But for the most part, you get to really enjoy these characters and you like these characters. Now, when you've just seen the movie, they're not as fleshed out. Obviously, if you've seen the television show, then you, these are characters that you've grown to love. And um, it's just, it is really comforting. It's nothing major. It's nothing, uh, it wasn't done poorly because I just recently reread a Roger Ebert's review of uh, Sex and the City 2 at random because I was bored and remembered how much, how bad that movie was. And it was just a money grab. This was a money grab. It was a big, huge hit. But it was because the fans really wanted to kind of see this and, and why not? Um, but they don't uh, abuse the characters. They don't put it in some, it, it completely fits right into the world. As soon as the movie starts, a few years have passed, a couple of people have been married, they kind of mention it in passing as every season usually in the show started that way. And so the timing is just still there. They don't bring, they don't send them off into Europe. They don't do anything weird. They don't have some weird family moving next door. It still stays within the tone of the television show. That's what I really like about that. Hence, it's very comforting. And so you just get right back into the rhythm of the show. You get right back into the characters that you love to see. And um, again, it's just, you know, here's the huge drama is that the royals are coming to, to have dinner and everything is supposed to go, you know, um, perfectly uh, as, as a well-tuned clock. And some things don't. And uh, even though, you know, if someone drops a spoon, a server drops a spoon and it's, oh, scandalous and they have to apologize, we laugh because we know that the different characters are mostly, you know, means well and, and something had happened and it's, it's no big deal in the big scheme of things. And I do enjoy that. When you watch the television show, someone doesn't have a dinner jacket and they have to wear their coat and tails and they look like a waiter now and oh my gosh, it's, it's just those things I, I do thoroughly enjoy. My mom is literally finishing season six right now. So we'll move on to the movie uh, probably tomorrow night. And I look forward to that because it's just nice and easy to sit and watch. And that's what we want to watch and, uh, for this particular movie to have find comfort in. Our fans should write in on our Facebook page or on Twitter or wherever um, or on our website if you can email us there and uh, let us know what your favorite comfort food films are right now. This actually made me think we should do a future episode about comfort food films as in movies about food because that's one of my another genre I really like and it'll give me a ch chance to talk about Big Night again, which can't oh. do enough about that in, the, in this show. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that as I told you, I, I, it took me a while to give you my third film, which was this one. Because, as you know, I kind of work at random, uh, and my head does, and then today, all of a sudden, it was like, oh, I thought of, like, a whole bunch that I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the show, and then, of course, the future episode, which I want to do on concert films, because why not just turn them, you know, turn your stereo up and your sound system up, turn the lights or flicker your lights, um, because we don't get to go outside uh, much and be in, in crowd gatherings. You go to concerts right now, so... <laughs> Concert, so let's why not you know do that and so if you have a favorite concert film that you'd like for us to mention or review on the show uh, please send that in as well but yeah there could be food ones that we could certainly do there's travel ones because we can't do any traveling right now <laughs> maybe we could do uh, family get-togethers but eh, maybe not uh, but uh, yeah there's a lot of different ways we can do that we can define as comfort and a lot of us that are, are watching films certainly if you're watching the show you're a fan of film that's how we're filling our day right now yeah, yeah, and if you have the Criterion channel, now's the time to really crank through that list. And if you have Prime, now's the time to really start doing searches because there's some interesting films. You just want to search on Prime. Prime is the hardest one to find those films. Their search is awful. Yeah, so but the Netflix, don't get me started on that. Though. Now is the time on Netflix actually to borrow your friends and maybe swap uh, passwords because when I go to someone else's house and turn their Netflix on. It's completely different because of the algorithm. My friend who watches a lot of documentaries, I was going through them and I didn't know this was on there. I didn't know this was on there. Where's, where's the Marvel films or where's the movies that I'm normally watching? Where's the independent films? And when they come over, and when I went over to the house, this is before, I'm talking about isolation. And so when everyone's come over to my place and open up Netflix, they're just like, where, is, where are these independent films? Where is this and where is that? And, and so it's really interesting to, 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 to find those things. Um, and so you can find some other films because you know, I actually know some people that have said, I've seen everything. Yeah. No, that's not possible. Trust me. I thought I had, I have like 250 movies on my Criterion queue. No, there's no way. 
Okay, I think we have to wrap up. I don't know if Brad's giving us the signal or not, but I can't see him. We have two minutes, three minutes. Okay. Three minutes here. I've kept the timer. I actually started. Oh, good job. I felt like we'd been going long, though. It's weird. No, it's because the first movies we talk long on because at least talk, talk about Cary Grant again. Though I do want to have to figure out how to review Charlie's Angels 2 full throttle in one of our comments. <laughs> You've already reviewed it. It's probably on the internet. We can just rerun that episode when I was younger and thinner. <laughs> I uh, always talk about Bob Hope films and I have a road picture. Oh, there's a travel movie. So I'll have to figure out which one's the which one's the good one. A travel movie I would want to do is something where it's actually shot on location in a, you know, far away. You know, there's some really cool movies that are shot in like all sorts of places, Iceland and Nepal, you know, I have to think about that one. I'd have to Anyway, write into us and make some suggestions for some episodes because we obviously need content. No, just We've always got ideas. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would just have spread a bunch of Criterion films actually. So, um, but they're ones I, I had seen. Oh, here's a tip because today's um, my sister's birthday. She'll never watch the show. And I totally forgot because, you know, it's, no, it's, it's still March. I'm still waiting for Easter. And I didn't realize today was her birthday and I had a bunch of Criterion movies. Now, Angela and I have a problem that when we buy movies, we forget to unwrap them. So when someone comes over to your house, they see that you haven't opened the movie that you bought them for a gift. So make sure when it's gifted to open the movie right away because you want to play it and make sure it doesn't skip. But when you buy movies, it's not a bad idea to keep them unwrapping because today what I did was I had a stack and went, the awful truth. <laughs> She'll love this movie and gave it to her for her birthday and it was seamless like I'd never forgotten. Now I got to replace the awful truth uh, my movie that i bought it was half off dang it i gotta pay full price so to wrap up the show and all of my tips uh well we can always highly recommend the awful truth pretty much any cary grant movie really a screwball comedy you can watch any of those uh, victor victoria which is now the third or fourth time i review that movie on this show i do love it and angela can highly recommend swing time i can as well you know those gene uh, uh astaire um, and rogers movies Really check most any of them out. They're wonderful. The Odd Couple, um, as well. Gene, uh, Jack Lemon and Martha, Walter Matthau made several films together. Check those out. Downton Abbey. There's a whole series of uh, six series for that uh, show. Yeah, as well right. Movie. And there will be a sequel eventually coming out when regular thing. As always, we want you to uh, check out our previous episodes on realfilmstop.com and check out our old reviews. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on uh, Twitter. You can listen to us on Peter Rookley and KMUZ. You can catch us on Salem uh, CCTV, CAM on Corvallis, as well as uh, CAN, CAAN, and on uh, Silverton. We want to thank our wonderful sponsors, our amazing two-man crew, Brad, Brian, Jason. Jason, so there's the three men. Well, two and two halves. And then, uh, of course, I want to thank my co-host and uh, thank you for watching all as always have a great day and great movie Thank <laughs> you.